the reason Hunter Biden is untouchable and the Burisma scandal could not be brought to light and the FBI interfered in the 2020 election and told Mark Zuckerberg not to publish anything about a leaked story about Hunter Biden and Burisma is because Burisma is at the dark heart of the grand Ukraine energy play. Burisma, the famous uh, private, largest private gas company in Ukraine. And I've been making the point now for, for many years that the reason Hunter Biden is untouchable uh, and the Burisma scandal could not be brought to light and the FBI interfered in the 2020 election and told Mark Zuckerberg not to publish anything about a leaked story about Hunter Biden and Burisma. Remember, the FBI specifically mentioned Marie Burisma to Mark Zuckerberg in the context of that laptop story. It's because Burisma is at the dark heart of the grand Ukraine energy play. I mean, we could go really deep on this. I mean, the the the, sh the, the short version of, of it is it has been a, a central plank of U.S. statecraft in seizing Eurasia, which has trillions of dollars in, in natural resource. Russia alone, it sits on $75 trillion worth of natural resources. For context, the U.S. only sits on $45 trillion gross. So, and then you have you know, Uzbekistan, you, you know, you have the whole Caspian Sea, you have the whole Central and Eastern Europe arc of Eurasia. It, it, is, it is the, where most of the world's resources are. And so it, that has been the long range plan since the Cold War of politically acquiring those companies, those countries. And the expansion of NATO has solidified that, you know, since 1990, you know, and, and the early 90s when we told Gorbachev, NATO wouldn't expand one inch, one in, inch to the east, but we we've, we've acquired all those territories over time. So I'm going with the long version now, just because we're just going to do it. But stop me at any time. In the 1990s, Russia was basically a U.S. vassal state. It was it was our it was like Greater Alaska. Boris Yeltsin was our puppet. He was literally giving real time updates to the National Endowment for Democracy, our our big CIA cutout in 1993 when uh, he was bombing his own parliament building, who were filled with nationalists who were opposing Yeltsin for going through with the shock therapy privatization to Western stakeholders. You had $2 trillion worth of wealth held, held by the government of the Soviet Union when they turned into a capitalist state, you know, when they transitioned from the communist uh, government to a democratic one with elections and, you know, of, of Yeltsin and then Putin. As part of that becoming a democracy, the State Department, the Harvard Endowment, uh, Wall Street banks, the George Soros financial firms, the, the Bill Browder financial firms, all of these different whole of society, um, uh, you know, international financiers and business interests descended on Russia to buy up at fire sale prices all of these previously state-owned assets. This is a big part of our diplomatic toolkit. When we transition authoritarian, an authoritarian government, we will privatize their gas companies, their oil companies, their diamond mines, their copper, their w whatever it is that's being held in trust for the people, so that whatever grows out of them, you know, whatever grows out of their soil, whatever flows from their Nile, whatever is in their their caves and mountains, it's no longer for those people. It belongs to Exxon Mobil. It belongs to De Beers. It belongs to Monsanto. And, and so those companies work with the State Department. They are part of these stakeholder negotiations within the blob. And so privatization is always, always, always on the table whenever we topple a government. And we work we have many back channels to accomplish that. Might be a little bit outside the scope unless you're super interested. But effectively, in the 1990s, Russia was, was our vassal. In fact, we even, you can watch a movie called Spinning Boris. It's a Hollywood movie with Jeff Goldblum. You know, from Jurassic Park, but it was this, this movie was about basically the U.S. efforts and the U.S. government efforts to rig the 1996 election for Boris Yeltsin because his own people hated him so much for giving their country to the United States and selling them out and handing it all over to you know George Soros and the Harvard Endowment uh, and Wall Street and London banks that they wanted him out. So the U.S. had to send in a Hollywood team, had to send in political consultants, had to send in you know. TV advertisements had to fund all these civil society institutions to astroturf uh, some sort of, of political semblance for their puppet. 
you know, this is a problem we ran into in Afghanistan, for for you know, for example, with people upset at Hamid Karzai. This is a very common thing: is we, you know, invade a country or we take over political control. The people have nothing, and they're unhappy. This is why we want people to have nothing but be happy. When they're unhappy, they they go against us, and they they might depose us from power. But effectively, when the, when the Russian stock market crashed, and finally there was no gas left in Yeltsin. Putin rose to power, and the big way that he reasserted Russia's emergence, reemergence on the world stage was through what our State Department called energy diplomacy, or, or basically soft power influence using Europe's dependency on Russian oil and gas, particularly the gas. Because a couple decades ago, 100% of Europe's natural gas, practically 100% of it almost, came from Russia. And this is just the natural... Uh, result of the economics of of gas. Natural gas is very cheap. You take it out of the ground, you put it in a pipeline, you take it to the other point, and the other country is gas. The only real alternative to that is something called liquefied natural gas, LNG, something folks you know may have heard a lot about because it's a major, major part. Uh, you know, it's it's this you know much more new technique than simply gas pipelines. But essentially, what it involves is you can do it over much longer distances. You can do it. You can do pipelines over whole oceans, uh, because or not pipelines because it, it doesn't require a pipeline. You liquefy the gas when it comes out of the ground. You store it in a, in a container. You ship it to any point on Earth or to Mars, hypothetically, and then you deliquefy it. But that's very expensive. It's much much more expensive, and so countries naturally wanted to buy Russian gas rather than much more expensive North American LNG. And because of their dependency on Russia for that, when, when Putin took power and began to wrest himself off of the sort of Yeltsinite, um, sort of NATO-friendly relations, he used Europe's dependent on Russian, dependence on, on Russian gas to trade that for, for favors to get more Russian political influence over Central and Eastern Europe to increase trade ties, to increase political ties, to create this sort of Russian soft power influence over the internal politics of countries stretching from Germany, you know, all, all the way into, into, the, into the Baltics. And around 2005, 2006, this begin, begins to be a problem for the State Department because you know, at that point, Russia was using a lot of hardball tactics. You know, in Georgia, they they turned off the gas. They you know it was going to be a cold winter in these uh, Central and European countries unless mm-hmm. they gave Russia what it wanted on its on its trade terms and its security terms and its political influence terms because they were dependent on Russia for gas. And so when this started happening time and again, the State Department developed a counter strategy. Again, this is 16 years ago. The State Department, with assistance from the CIA and the Pentagon and the whole diplomatic toolkit of energy NGOs and things like this, and in order to get off of get Europe to get off primarily hydrocarbons at the time, that was the main advantage that that Europe had. Is this is sort of before the fracking revolution really took off, but also to go through what it called energy diversification which meant that as part of America's security guarantees for Europe, as part of our diplomatic and financial support and guarantees for Europe, they would have to buy more expensive uh, gas from the West than gas from the East. Now, you can only do so much before a country goes broke, unless they have an alternative gas buyer, and this is where Burisma will come back into the picture. But so these countries went through about a decade of diversification milestoning. You know, they went from 100% to 80% to, to 70% to 60% Russian gas as the State Department continually applied pressure for them to give their, their taxpayer dollars to Americans and, and British companies like Shell instead of from the Russian Federation via Gazprom. So the State Department has seen Gazprom as an instrument of statecraft for Russia, again, for 16 years now, and there was a time when Gazprom was the largest company in the world in the early 2000s, just to give perspective for how influential this was. Before this energy diversification program, you know, uh, cut back on a lot of their profits. But the the key to this was Ukraine, because all of this gas line, gas pipeline architecture is already pre-existing. You know, you, you, there's, there's the, 
There's the natural gas pipelines that go directly from Russia into Ukraine and then on into Europe. And then there's an alternate pathway that was established years ago called Nord Stream 1, which was directly into Germany. And then Germany, you know, as, as, the, as folks know the tale, tried to develop Nord Stream 2 with Russia. And what happened to that happened to that. But this, this State Department CIA Pentagon strategy of killing Gazprom and, re and replacing the gas market with Americans, Canadians, Brits, has been this long-range plan that has been the bane of American statecraft because their inability to get it down to zero, their inability, you know, there's, it's two steps forward, one step back, three steps back, as, as different rising politicians in Central and Eastern Europe want what's best for their people. Want, they are responsible to their constituents. Their people want cheaper energy. Russia's offering the cheaper energy. So absent the ability to provide a cheaper commodity product, the people organically have wanted that Russian gas, and so they had to constantly suppress populist political groups in Central and Eastern Europe who might run on a platform or who are running on a platform of buying energy from Russia. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.